everyone and welcome back to The Journey. Today, as you can see, we're going to be talking about cardiovascular system. Now, before we get into any diseases and what the nurse should expect or look out for, I just want to give a quick anatomy about how the heart functions, okay? And you may say, why do we need to know that? It's very, very beneficial because as you can see how the heart functions, you can see where the heart is going to be damaged, where the disruption is taking place, and what to look out for. And it's also a big, big indicator for your signs and symptoms. If you understand how the heart functions, that will save you a million and ten times all of the study and time of um, trying to remember the signs and symptoms, okay? Because they're going to reflect the function of the anatomy of the heart. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and get on into it. So, as you can see here on this diagram, I made this diagram for those of you guys who are visual learners. I am a visual learner, okay? And like I said, a uh, picture is worth a thousand words, okay? So here I have blue and red, okay? And the blue and red represents the different types of blood. Now, I'm not saying that we have blue blood inside our bodies because, of course, we do not, but there is a differential um, between the two, okay? And uh, within our bodies, it's pretty much a bright red and then you have a darker red, okay? But for learning purposes, it's easier to stand out more if I use blue, and red. So in your textbooks and things like that, you're going to see blue, all right? But it doesn't mean that it's technically blue. And blue represents the oxygenated blood, which means that the blood doesn't have any oxygen in it. It's carrying CO2 and all the other waste products that the blood um, is filtering out in itself, okay? And then the red blood represents the oxygenated blood, right? That's carrying all of the nutrients that the body needs and the oxygen, clearly, because it's oxygenated blood, okay? So that's where that bright red color comes from. So... Now that we know that, the heart has four chambers. We have a right atrium, we have a right ventricle, we have a left atrium, and we have a left ventricle. All right, and we already know the largest part of the ventricle, uh, largest part of the chamber is the left ventricle. Okay, so why is that? Because it has to do most of the pumping. Okay, that's where you give that big push, right? Because it has to go to the remaining of the body. So now that we know that, all right. Here are my lungs. I have my right lung and I have my left lung. And as you can see, I did this on purpose, right? My right lung is bigger than my left lung. Why is that? Because in real life, right, our lungs only have two lobes, two lobes on the left side. Why? Because it has to make room for the heart. So when that cardiac, cardiac notch sits, right, it takes away space from the lung. So the left side only has two lobes, where the right side of the lung has three lobes. All right, so now I'm gonna go through the process of how the body is functioning, right? So here, down here, I have a little stick figure person here and there. So that represents the lower part of my body, all right? So remember, after, after your body has used all the nutrients and things like that, everything has a waste. The same way how when we eat food, right, and we have to go to the bathroom, those are our waste products from that food. So same thing, the body carries its own waste products, right? And it goes into the bloodstream. So um, once the body is finished using the oxygen, things like that, it secretes the CO2 into the bloodstream. And from there, it's going to be carried up into the, into the cardiovascular system to be dumped and filtered, right? So I have my blue blood, right? My deoxygenated blood traveling up right through the veins all right so blue blood which is the oxygenated blood is going to be carried through veins and my bright red blood which is my oxygenated blood is going to be carried through arteries okay and that is the rule all the time veins go through um blue arteries go through red all right so here i drew a little stick figure okay and the blue blood is going to be traveling up right this is supposed to be a 3D model, so it's not coming through here. This is actually behind, okay? So it's supposed to be behind, and eventually it's going to pass through my inferior vena cava. My inferior vena cava is one of the biggest veins that I have in my body, right? And eventually it's going to dish out to the superior vena cava, and eventually it's going to go into the right atrium, okay? So with my blue marker here, okay, um, I have the blood that's coming through the right atrium, Right, so the blood is now in here. Now I have a valve that I have to pass through. That's my tricuspid valve, right? And it's called tricuspid because it has three 
different um, vowel connections, okay? And when it opens and closes, right, blood goes through, which makes that lub dub sound, right? Lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. So that is where the sounds are coming from when you hear your heartbeat, all right? So as the blood is going through the tricuspid valve, once it's open, right, it's going to make its way into the right ventricle. Once it's made its way through the right ventricle, it has to pass another valve, which is my pulmonary semilunar valve, okay? Now, I'm not saying this for you guys to remember. You guys don't have to remember this, but like I said, just grasp the concept of how the heart is working, okay? So it goes to the pulmonary semilunar valves, up to the pulmonary trunk, to out to right and left pulmonary arteries, okay? So PEA is my pulmonary arteries, pulmonary arteries, okay? And it's going to dish out into the right and left lung. So now I have that blue blood, into my lung. Same thing on this side, right? Now, the lungs are responsible for the exchanges of gases or, or that type of sort of thing, okay? So, main two gases that it's responsible for is going to be your oxygen and your CO2. So, the CO2 is brought here. It makes that exchange of gases. I am going to get my red marker, right? It makes that exchange of gases. And it is going to bring back the blood, right? The same blue blood it is going to bring it back with oxygen. And as it's bringing the oxygen, it is going through the right and left pulmonary veins, okay? Here. Now, this is uh, one of the exceptions where you have your veins carrying red blood, okay? There's another exception during childbirth in the fetus, but we're not, don't worry about that, right? This is your exception where you have veins that is carrying red blood, all right? Any other time, they're carrying blue blood, but for this exception here, they are carrying red blood. And they're carrying it back because it just came from the lungs. The lungs deposit CO2, right? CO2 is here. The lungs is bringing oxygen. Right? So that oxygen is now being brought back into the pulmonary veins. From the pulmonary veins, right? It's supposed to be a 3D effect, so it's not exactly connected here. This dishes out all the way to the other side, right? To my left atrium. So this is gonna meet up. The blood is now going to meet up in this area. Okay? So that's the blood. As the blood is coming through, it has to pass through another valve. That valve is known as my mitral valve or my bicuspid valve. Bicuspid because it has two valves that is attached to it, bicuspid, all right? But it's also known as mitral. So if you hear the word mitral, we're talking about the same valve, all right? So the blood goes through that valve. As it enters, it's now into the left ventricle. When that blood reaches to the left ventricle, is then going to be pushed, right, as hard as it possibly can, into the aortic semilunar valve, okay? Like I said, don't trip about the name, just get the concept. So it's going to go through this valve. Once it gets through, this is the extending aorta, right? And the blood is going to continue through the aortic arc. Now here, as you can see, I have three different areas where the blood is going to also um, deposit, okay? In this area, I have my brachiosympathetic artery, I have my left common carotid artery, and I have my left subclavian artery. And they're going to supply blood to this region here, okay? So that's that. And then eventually it is going to work its way down. Remember, this is a 3D model, right? So behind is you're going to find your descending aorta. So the whole thing is your aorta, is just different parts of it, um, mentioned different names but eventually it's gonna to go to um, the rest of the body. So the, the veins pick up all of the debris and trash, if you would wanna say, right? Dumps it in, it filters, helps filters um, through the lungs when it's bringing back oxygenated blood, and then it's carrying the rest of the nutrients that the body's going to need and pretty much feed to the rest of the body. So it's a system that's coming up in and out to the lungs, lungs bring them back to the left. After, after that, it's gonna come through the left to the rest of the body to feed and give nutrients and oxygen to the rest of the body, okay? And that is the system time and time and time and time again, 
okay, from the time that you were born to the time that you will decease, okay? Your body, your heart is constantly doing that with every pump, okay? With every pump. So today, as you can see, we're gonna go ahead and talk about congestive heart failure. So with congestive heart failure, it's pretty much the heart inability to perfuse the right amount of cardiac output to um, be given to the rest of the body, pretty much in a nutshell is what that means. So here, I got this from the book, all right, from the Brothers book, and pretty much the inability of the heart to maintain adequate cardiac output to meet the metabolic needs of the body because of impaired pumping ability, okay? So somewhere within the heart is not able to function properly, and therefore it's a lack of cardiac output, which is going to give a lack of perfusion because it does have to feed the rest of the body and its main organs as far as the kidneys, the liver, things like that, all right? So it can also lead to congestions of the lungs, which eventually is going to lead to acute pulmonary edema, which eventually can ultimately um, result in a life-threatening condition. Also, you have an acute and you have chronic. So with acute heart failure, it's pretty much the onset is happening suddenly, okay? So with acute, is anything um, up until six months, okay? Anything after six months or longer, that is chronic. So with my chronic heart failure, it develops over time. That's something that happens right then and there, but it does have its times where it can have a two um, episode here and there. So the types of heart failure, okay? So there's four different types. Not saying that there's four different ones, but pretty much where uh, exactly in the heart it's affecting and why you're going to see the results that you're going to see, which presents itself as right or left side heart failure, okay? So of course, I put the main one, you have your right ventricular failure where your, vent your right ventricle itself fails, right? Or your left ventricle fails. Now, your left ventricle is more prone to be the one to um, fail initially, and then from there, it can progress to both of them failing, okay? Um, not saying that the right side is not the one that can only be affected, but it's more common that you'll see the left side that's affected first, and then eventually it triggers to the right side being affected, all right? Also, you have forward failure, which forward failure is pretty much the lack of output um, of the ventricles, which eventually is going to decrease perfusion to the vital organs that we have in our bodies, okay? Because the body's not able to flow to give um, the perfusion that it needs to um, the rest of the body, okay? You also have your backward uh, failure, which your backward failure is pretty much a build up um, in the atrium which is going to increase pressure in the atrium area, all right? So think of backward, right? It's backing up, so it's going to lead pressure in the atrium area, whereas forward, right, I'm trying to go forward and to perfuse the body, there is a lacking of perfusion to the organs, okay? If that helps in some type of way. Also, you have your low output. So your low output, of course, is the lack of cardiac output to meet the body demands, right? And then you have your high output, which is pretty much the heart is working harder and harder to try to meet the body demands, okay? So again, you can, I can either be working really, really hard, or I can be working, but it's just a lack, right? I'm not putting out enough that would um, um, require the body to function at its optimal level because, again, it's not meeting the body's demands, okay? Also, I have my systolic failure. And my systolic failure is pretty much problems that's going to lead with contraction and ejection of the blood, okay? So contracting and then ejecting the blood out, okay? So contracting and ejecting, all right? For systolic and diastolic, it's pretty much going to be problems that's going to be with the filling of the blood, right? And relaxing. So the relaxing and the filling, all right? So those of you guys who probably was trying to figure out what's the difference between systolic and diastolic, well, um, you know, I've been repeating for a reason, so that way you know the systolic deals with the contraction of the heart, where diastolic deals with the relaxation, all right, and the feeling. Clinical manifestations, which is also one of my signs and symptoms, also my nursing assessment, okay? So I've made a chart here where you can see right-sided versus left-sided, okay? Sometimes when you see it together, you can kind of look to see what are some of the similarities and what are the differences right on one board, okay? So with right-sided heart failure, I put in purple here so you can kind of, kind of jump out at you, all right? Deals more with systemic circulation, all right? Whereas left side deals more of 
pulmonary system, okay, which is my lungs and, and systemic is pretty much generalized the remaining parts of the body, okay? So, with right side, right, I have my dependent edema, okay, which you're mostly going to see in your legs, your foot, or your sacral area, and mainly your ankles, okay? You also have your JVD, which is jugular venous distension, and pretty much you have that when you have an increased uh, venous pressure. All right, you also have your abdominal distension, which is pretty much edema within the abdomen. You also have your hepatomegaly, and with that, it can be multiple reasons. You have, um, it could be from the portal veins, which fills up with blood and um, causes the ascites, okay, which causes the abdominal distension, and then um, there can be a disruption um, in that area where the, the, the blood is backing up and it causes pressure and swelling on the liver, which causes it to be enlarged, okay? So you also have your swelling of your fingers and your hands, okay? Your splenomegaly, which is the enlargement of your spleen, okay? You also have your anorexia, your nausea, your weakness. And anorexia in this term means poor appetite, okay? Also, you have your weight gain. With these people, they tend to gain more weight, not because they're eating a lot, but the fact that they're retaining so much fluid on them, right? Because it's not able to um, filter out and go through where it needs to go. So eventually it backs up, right? And eventually that fluid stays on them, which is why you have the edema. Uh, okay? Also, you have your nocturnal diuresis. And nocturnal just pretty much means at night, and diuresis means to urinate. So you're urinating at night, and the reason why that is happening is because when you have fluid retention, right, um, you start to gain the weight, you have the edema, right, there's a lack of perfusion to the kidneys, so the kidneys begins to go to oliguria. And oliguria is pretty much um, a urine output of 500 ml for the whole entire day, right, which is not supposed to be, it's supposed to be at least maybe a thousand or so, and you're only putting out half of that for the day. So that's all the urea. And urea, sorry, is pretty much only 50 ml for the whole 24 hours. Okay, so in case you guys um, came across that while, while studying, those are the difference between anuria and oliguria. Okay, and like I said before, a patient who's going through this, eventually you're going to have oliguria, and with that, the body's going to try to release uh, a thing called renin. And renin is pretty much going to cause the secretion of your aldosterone, which is your ADH. And with that, it's going to cause an increase in intravascular fluid, which is why at nighttime you, you end up going to the bathroom. Okay? Eventually, as this progress, you can lead to anuria, where you, um, you barely have any urination going on whatsoever because of the poor perfusion of the kidneys. Okay? Remember, this is systemic. This is affecting the whole systemic area. Okay, right side of failure. Also, your blood pressure, right? So your blood pressure can either increase or decrease. If it increases, it's because of the fluid volume excess. If it decreases, it's because of lack of the pumping failure, okay? So there's a pump failure somewhere along the line, all right? So now we're on left-sided heart failure. And with left-sided, you are going to have problems with breathing, okay? Just think of that in your mind. Left side is mainly going to be breathing. It's going to attack your resp respiratory system, okay? So you're going to have signs of pulmonary congestion, which is your dyspnea, which dyspnea means difficulty breathing. Cough, you're going to have a dry, hacking cough, non-productive cough. In the beginning, you're going to have a non-productive cough, a dry, hacking cough, okay? So say that again, just so you guys can kind of get, get um, an understanding of what's happening, okay? Um, then you will have the pulmonary crackles. Okay, and with the pulmonary crackle, again, um, is that is that crackling noise, and that's because the alveolus is trying to open up, and, and it's and it and it's opening up, it makes that crackling noise. Okay. Also, you have a decrease in oxygen saturation. Now, you don't want the saturation to go any low, any low, any anywhere lower than ninety percent. Okay. Um, so ninety-five, great. Hundred, even greater. All right, now if you didn't know what your COPD patients, which I am going to do um, a video on COPD and let you know all the treatments and all the other stuff, right? So um, look forward for that video. But with COPD, those type of patients can live off of um, anywhere as low as 88% to 93% of 
oxygen, okay? So just know what kind of patients you're dealing with. If you're having a COPD patient, of course, if they're 90, that is great, right? Because people who have COPD, you don't want them to give them too much oxygen because their body is naturally adapted, um, have adapted to a low, um, low carrying oxygen within the body, that if you was to give them more oxygen, you can actually do more harm than good. All right, so for those people who have COPD, your rate is going to be somewhere between 88, 89 to 93, okay? And of course, if you're talking about just a regular person, no lower than 90, all right? Then you have your tachypnea, which you're breathing a lot faster than you normally would, right? Because you're trying to get more air in, you're trying to get more exchanges going, okay? And you want to kind of blow off that CO2 that your body's been collecting. Also, you have your perioximal nocturnal dyspnea, which pretty much means you have sudden attacks that happens during the night, all right? So um, difficulty breathing at night. Also, you have your blood tinge or pink frothy sputum, okay? So whether they call it blood tinge frothy sputum or pink tinge frothy sputum or pink frothy sputum, it is all the same thing here because at the end of the day, it is blood in the sputum, okay? So when you're coughing up blood or any, anything in that nature, okay, that is a red flag that you want to watch out for because no one should be coughing up blood, all right? Also, as you can see here, similarities on this side, you have increase or a decrease in blood pressure, which again, it can be because of fluid volume excess or the pump um, failure, okay? Then you have your GI ulcerations of uh, your digestion. So that's also similar to here where it has anorexia, nausea, right, and weakness. So there wants to be some type of all alternation going on because again, what are you going to pay more attention to, eating or breathing? Most people are going to pay more attention to breathing. So if you're having a trouble, a hard time breathing, you're not really going to want to eat, okay? So that can also, that, that can also alter your digestive um, tract, okay? And your decrease in brain function, right? Because remember, you have to perfuse oxygen to the brain. If you can't breathe, you have difficulty breathing. There's a lack of oxygen that's carrying around within your body that goes to your brain, that affects your brain. You can um, have signs of being uh, dizzy, lightheaded, um, confusion, right? Those things um, when you look at your altered level of consciousness, okay? So if you want more information about altered level of consciousness or just about the brain itself, please uh, feel free to check out my other videos about um, neuro. Okay, you'll find all the information you want to know about the brain, all right? So this is the difference between your left and your right. They have some similarities, but they are very different, okay? So now I'm going to um, bring back that diagram that I showed you in the beginning, and I am going to show you how that diagram can help you remember these signs and symptoms. As you can see, this helps you to understand the difference between right heart failure versus left side heart failure, okay? And with the right side, as you can see, right, we're carrying the the, 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 the oxygenated blood, right? So the body is responsible for bringing up all of that blood, right, that extra fluid into the heart, so that the heart can then filter it out with oxygen to bring it back to the rest of the body. So on this side, what you will see with right sided heart failure, right, you're going to have edema because if the if if this is there's a problem, right, with the blood coming in, okay, so I'll be racing here because the blood has a problem coming in, right? The blood has a problem coming in and all of that fluid is backing up, okay, I'm just gonna use my blue marker here, and all of that fluid is backing up, right? It can't come through here because there's some type of malformation going on here. That starts backing up, right? What happens to the rest of my of my body? Because this is part of my lower body. This represents my lower body, right? That blood doesn't get to flow through. It stays down here. So what happens? I have the dependent edema, right? So my legs are swollen. I have the pitting in different areas, right? Um, I have the JVD, right? Because that's my that's my veins. Eventually, it's going to fill up, right? And it's going to have that tension, that pressure. So I have my JVD, okay? okay. I'm also going to see my abdominal distension, right? Because those veins that are supposed to be filling into that heart to pour, right, and to flow, is not able to do that. So I have my abdominal distension. I also may have hepatomegaly, where my liver gets um, enlarged. I have my 
my spleen, right? My spleen can also get enlarged. So I have spleen, um, splenomegaly, I have hepatomegaly, I have my abdominal distension, I have the swelling maybe in my fingers, right? Because I have veins that's supposed to be carrying into the blood, right? But if my right side is failing, all that fluid gets backed up. I also, I'm also going to have my anorexia and nausea, right? You may feel distended and, and the bloated that you don't want to eat, right? So you don't have an appetite, you feel nausea because eventually all this fluid and accumulation and buildup and the abdominal distension, right, makes you may, may you may be nauseous. Also, you may have nocturnal diaphoresis, right? Where all of a sudden you're going to the bathroom at night. Now, with the left side, right? My left is going to be responsible for carrying the oxygenated blood, right? So where is the big responsibility coming from? My lungs, right? Because the lungs have to go ahead and bring that back as um, oxygenated blood. So I'm going to have here with my red, right? It is coming back. It is coming back, right? Through the veins into the arteries. So it's coming back here. It's going through and coming out. If any one of these areas fail, whether it is my ventricle area, right, what's going to happen? That blood is going to backflow, and it's going to backflow somewhere. So let's say this valve or this chamber wasn't really working or pumping efficiently, and only little, little driplets of blood was going through, right? The, blood, the body is still going to produce the amount, at least on the right side, if it's functioning and it's working, right? So I'm going to have a whole bunch of blood, but only little drops here and there is getting in. And more blood is coming, and more blood is coming because the heart does not stop. It pumps and pumps and pumps and pumps and pumps. So each time, more blood and more blood and more blood and more blood, right? And all I'm getting is drips, 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 drips in here. So it makes the heart want to work harder and harder and harder and harder and harder, right? Because they're saying, hey, the body is not getting any perfusion. The body's not getting any nutrients. It's not getting any oxygen. What is going on? So the heart is saying, oh my gosh, we have to pump harder and faster. So it's pumping and it's pumping and it's pumping, but it's not doing it effectively. So because it's not doing it effectively, we're still not getting anywhere. So you may see a person, they have tachycardia, and you're like, but I don't understand, the heart is pumping fast, but it's not effective, okay? It's not effective because down here, it's not able to push and squeeze as hard as, 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 hard as it can. So it's going really fast, but not effective, okay? So it starts backing up. Once it backs up into here, eventually where it's going to go, where it came from, so it's going to back up into the pulmonary veins, into my lungs. So that blood is going to sit there and sit there and sit there and sit there, right? Until so finally, it gets higher and higher and higher and higher, right? So you can, as you can see, you can see that the lung is starting to drown or it will drown, okay? And that's exactly what happens when you hear a patient have crackling, okay, which is why that is very important to do your lung assessment or your respiratory assessment because you want to make sure that you don't hear any crackling. And the reason why you hear crackling is because as the alveoli are being buried with this, this blood, right, think of it like water, is being buried with it, right, it tries to open up. And as it tries to open up, right, it makes a popping sound. So that opening go. So as these individual alveoli are popping, that's where you hear the crackling, right? So when you think of, um, what's that cereal, Rice Krispies, right? Snack, crackle, pop, and uh, even when you put a pour it in the milk, and you can hear it cr um, like crackling, right? Because that is when the milk is getting through those, those, those areas, right? And it's trying to open up those pockets, you hear that crackling sound, okay? It is doing that same effect, right? Where the alveoli is trying to open up because it's, 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 it's being crushed by the blood that, that's there, that it tries to open itself up. And as it's opening itself up, it makes that crackling noise, okay? So again, apnea, right? Because the respiratory is going to be involved. Because as it starts to fill up, right, it gets harder and harder and harder to breathe. So that patient is going to be in pulmonary distress, right? Um, pulmonary edema can, can occur. All right. You also have um, the coughing up of pink frothy sputum. Eventually, when it gets when it gets in the later part, but 
um, normally you just probably have a dry hacking cough. So when you hear a patient has a dry hacking cough, that lets you know that's left side, right? If the patient is um, spitting up blood, because what happened, right? I'm coughing, I'm coughing, I'm coughing, trying to clear my lungs, right? And the blood is just constantly rising, and I may just end up spitting out some blood, right? That is a sign of left-sided failure, because where is that blood um, storing? It is happening in the lungs, okay? You may have the profuse sweating, the cold, clammy hands. Um, you may have cyanosis, right? You're going to start looking cyanotic because if I have all of the red blood that's backing up in here and none of it is going to the body, eventually the body is going to say, hey, I am being deprived of oxygen. And that pink, nice color that you see um, of your cells is no longer going to be pink and nice. It is now going to be blue, indicating that, hey, there's a lack of oxygen within the body, all right? So they're going to look blue, they're going to have respiratory distress, okay? So as you can see, try to have that picture in your mind of um, left side and right side and how the heart works. Because when you know how the heart works and you sit back, you could be taking any test, just sit back, sit back, have that picture in your mind, and eventually you'll begin to see the difference between left side and right side, all based on the anatomy of knowing how the heart flows and how it works. All right, diagnostic testing. So with congestive heart failure, these are some things that you can do. And if you notice, as I go into more of the cardiac um, disorders and diseases, you're going to see that the diagnostic testings are, kind of, are going to be kind of similar, okay? So of course you're going to do your ECG, which is your electrocardiogram. Um, it used to formally be known as EKG. Some hospitals still use the term EKG, some uses the word ECG. It is the same thing, okay? So um, it's just your preference and what you choose to use, but um, it is an electrocardiogram, and I'm guessing that's why they have ECG, because really and truly it starts with a C, not a K, all right? So you have your echocardiogram, all right? And this is pretty much to help determine your EF, and your EF is pretty much your ejection fraction. Now you may say, what is your ejection fraction? Your ejection fraction is pretty much how hard the heart has to work to eject um, the blood to um, throughout throughout your, your system and how efficient it is. Okay, so it goes by a percentage. Um, you have 100 percent, you have 90, 50, um, 20 percent, and so on and so forth. All right, the higher the number, the better. The lower the number, the worse um, the heart is, or how. Hard, um, the heart has to work. So that pretty much means that the person has a poor, poor cardiac um, output or um, cardiac perfusion. Okay, if the EF um, is pretty much 10% or 30% or so. That means um, there's barely any blood that's being pushed out and that's ejecting to supply to the rest of the body. So these patients can be very tired very quickly, things like that. Okay, because the heart has to work so much, and in, as it's working so much, only that little bit. A little amount um, is coming out to help confuse the body. Okay. Also, you have your chest X-ray, right? Which is a given. Most of the time, anything's going on with your heart, you're going to do a chest X-ray, right? Um, you also have your non-invasive or invasive uh, radionuclide uh, ventrography, and you can do it as part of the cardiac cath lab, which makes it invasive, or you can do it as a non-invasive way. Okay. You also have your labs. All right, and just because you say lab doesn't mean that you're going to get the labs that you want, right? Because when you say lab, you have no kind of labs, right? And um, most of the time, it just comes with your CBC and your um, Chem 7 or your Chem 12, okay? Which does not include your cardiac labs. So you want to make sure that there are some cardiac labs there, okay? So your BP, BPN, I'm sorry, BNP, sorry, um, which is going to be an indicator, a big indicator of heart failure. You also have your troponin, your cardiac profile, medic, um, labs, okay? Um, cardiac profile, cardiac enzymes is pretty much the same. You'll see them kind of bundled together. Your CKMD and your CK, um, you'll see them in that as well. Okay, your troponin, you'll, you'll definitely see them there. So you want to make sure that when you're asking for labs, that you add cardiac um, profile or your cardiac um, your labs in there because it will automatically come with those, okay? And of course, if you have increased levels 
um, of your cardiac um, lab that can show that there's an increase in filling pressure, okay? Also, you have your cardiac stress testing, which pretty much, um, it pretty much monitors the heart and how well it handles or deals with stress, okay? So um, one of the main things that they do is pretty much kind of push you to a treadmill, running treadmill, and they'll have you running for over a period of time, and they will um, gradually increase it in different intervals to see exactly how well your heart is able to handle the stress, and then they'll um, go down until they turn off the machine, and then they'll also assess you as you're resting, okay? See how, 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 um, the heart is able to function and how well it's dealing with that type of stress. So that is your cardiac stress test and they will definitely put all the electrodes and things connected with you and they will see your, your rhythm strips, okay? Also, you have your cardiac catheterization, which is your cardiac cath or your cath lab, so they say, and pretty much they may do that in the diagnostic finding to try to figure out, okay, what is causing the heart failure? What is going on, right? Is it coronary artery disease, which that's what CAD is? Okay, or well, that's what it stands for, and then, or is it a schema, is it an MI, is it, you know, what is it, what's causing it? So, again, with the cardiac cath lab, they pretty much kind of put you um, in a room, um, the cath lab in particularly, they have people in the, in the monitors and watching from the standby, looking at the screen, and you have your nurses and your doctors who are also in the room, and they go ahead and they fish a wire up into the right groin or left groin, or wherever the doctor desires, but mainly in those areas, and with that, they're going to fish that wire and they may highlight it with a dye. And when that dye highlights, it will light up all the different vessels in that area and they can kind of see if there's a blockage somewhere um, or what's going on with the heart. Right, so now we're getting to the main important thing that the nurse should watch out for, which is your nursing assessment. I mean, your nursing interventions, okay? So with your nursing interventions, you're going to place the patient in a high power position. Why high? Because remember, they may have trouble breathing. You can get a better um, um, intake of, 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 of air when you're sitting upright, okay? You breathe a lot better, you feel a lot better, and you can take in more air that way, all right? Also, you want to administer oxygen if possible. Um, yes, you need a doctor's orders, but if you see the patient is in some type of distress, you can give at least two liters um, nasal cannula. Um, without an order, okay? So you do have that right as a nurse because you can't act in the meantime while you're trying to reach the doctor or so, you can give at least two liters of oxygen per nasal cannula. All right, so just in case, I remember I had a question about that and you know, we were like, oh, there's no, there's no doctor's order, you can't do it, right? And wrong, that was the answer, okay? And the rationale was that very same rationale. Nurses are allowed to at least give two liters of oxygen for nasal cannula if the patient is in some type of distress or so uh, without a doctor's orders so that way uh, while they're waiting they can at least have some um, efficient um, cardiac I mean, oxygen saturation okay also you want to assess the lung sound okay so you want to watch out for that cracking or that wheezing noise okay also you want to uh, pay attention to the patient history about their respiratory system okay and what I mean by that is you want to ask them you know um, do you have any difficulty sleeping at night? Because sometimes these questions or these things may not be on the top of their heads to just say, oh, this has been going on with me for the past couple of days, and you know, what, what is this, what is that? They may not think about that at that moment, right? They may have shortness of breath, and they may forget what, what's going on. So it's also good to um, ask those questions, you know. How many pillows do you sleep at at night? If they say three, why three? You have to prop, prop them up to kind of sit upright to help you breathe better. Um, you know, do you have difficulty um, breathing when you're laying down? Is it positional? Exactly what's going on? So that way you can kind of get a better understanding of what's, what's going on. Or they tell you, um, you know, when you're walking, do you feel easily exerted? Or do you feel, um, you know, um, weak? Or, you know, whatever it is that you need to know about the patient to kind of get a, paint a better picture, you want to go ahead and ask those questions, okay? Especially with the respiratory system, just because you can have that life-threatening deal of, Edema, all right. So you also want to make sure you have your IV access, which of course they should be coming in with their IV access. But you want to make sure that they have IV access because um, two medications that you may get readily is your diuretics, which your diuretics is your medication that helps you go to the bathroom because they are carrying all this fluid, right? And you want to remove that fluid from them. So you want to make sure that they are able to perfuse um, their kidneys and 
and get all of that extra fluid off of them. Also, morphine. And one thing that people don't know about morphine, yes, it's a pain uh, killer, right? And um, we, we all love that. But it also decreases the venous preload, all right, and decreases the work of breathing, all right? So again, you want to make sure that you're not giving too much because then now um, it, it suppresses the respiratory system, all right? There we have a breathing problem, you want to watch out but it can decrease the venous preload. So a lot of times you'll see morphine go hand in hand with a lot of cardiac issues, okay? Also, a Foley catheter, right? Because we're going to diarrhea this person, you will want to make sure that you're paying attention to the eyes and O's, which is your input and output, right? You want to make sure that um, um, that's balanced, right? They're not holding on to more than what they're putting out. So all of those things you want to watch out for, you want to see if they're oliguric or if they're anuria, Right, because then that lets you know that the kidneys is affected in some type of way. So um, your eyes and nose can tell you a lot about what's going on with the patient. Also, you want to prepare for intubation on your vent support just in case they do go into respiratory distress. You want to make sure that you have all of your equipment with you to help assist um, the doctor in intubating the patient. Okay. Also, you want to avoid large amounts of caffeine and um, things that have caffeine is your chocolate, your tea coffee and your carbonated beverages, okay? Like your Pepsi or your, or your Coke, Diet Coke, even those things, right? All those have your caffeine. You want to kind of avoid that because again, that causes tachycardia on the heart, which puts more stress and strain on the heart itself. Also, you want to make sure that the patient is on a low sodium, low fat, low cholesterol. I know you're probably saying, what kind of diet is that, right? Because butter, and everything um, that's not good for you make the food taste good, right? But in this case, you want to make sure that this patient is put on a cardiac diet because all those things are not good for the heart and put extra strain. So you want to make sure that they're on a low sodium because sodium what? Retains fluid and you want to get rid of fluid. So you want low sodium, right? Low cholesterol so there's no plaque buildup or anything where it causes a blockage, right? Because you already have a perfusion or a cardiac um, output problem, right? So those are things to keep in mind and you want to teach the patient even after when they're going home about, about it so that way you can kind of stay on track with that diet, okay? Also, potassium rich foods, okay? You want to make sure that you give them potassium rich food because they are going to be getting diuretics and with the diuretics it is going to um, sometimes cause a low potassium hypokalemia within the bloodstream. So when that happens you want to kind of prepare the patient to say, hey, Go ahead and supplement yourself with potassium rich foods. And they do love to ask questions about this on egg class. And yes, your answer is not going to be bananas because it is so obvious that yes, bananas have potassium. Your answer is going to be oranges. And you're going to be like, what? I did not know oranges have potassium. Trust me, I know because I've been there and the answer was oranges. But I'm not saying that oranges is only going to be the answer. But kind of think about those fruits that are so rare and um, the different things that you would kind of expect them to have. So with bananas, that is not going to be your choice. Your choice is going to be um, oranges or some other sort of things like that, okay? So you want to make sure that you are paying attention to the other food groups that may have or carry those things because I'm telling you, a, a answer selection is not going to be bananas. It is not going to be there at all. Also, you're going to avoid activities that is going to increase the pressure on the heart, right? Or workload on the heart. So again, you want to make sure that you're speaking with your doctor, that you know exactly um, what regimen they want you to be on. Most of the time, no more than 30 minutes. Five minutes warm-up, 30 minute workout is what you're going to have. And it's going to be something where um, it's easy for you, but beneficial to you or your patient, um, as well as um, challenging the heart enough where it can kind of strengthen the heart, okay? So one of the best things is walking. And we may think that, you know, walking is not much, but walking is one of the best exercises you can do, okay? And also you want to watch out too if the patient has a hard time talking while they're exercising. If they do, that may be too much strain on the heart. So you want to make sure that if you have a patient who has congestive heart failure, that while they're exercising that they're able to talk. So walking and talking. If they're walking and all of a sudden they're getting shortness of breath and they can't really talk or they can't talk, carry a conversation because they're trying to breathe, you may want to let them rest, right? Let them um, 
to be able to ease that stress and that workload on that heart, right? You may want to elevate their legs or so, kind of help um, with dizziness and try to bring um, circulation back to the heart, right? And again, you want to make sure that you're taking it easy. So it doesn't mean that they cannot work out. You just want to make sure that you're monitoring it and that they have their safety um, implemented and that they are not pushing themselves to the limit. All right, and you want to make sure that they're exercising um, maybe a six weeks regimen or so, and then from there the doctor will decide if he wants to push it a little bit more or slow it down. Okay, so it all goes based on the doctor and how well the patient is tolerating. So you have monitor your weight, and I put in red because I cannot stress this enough. There are going to be questions on this. I, I, I confidently can say this because this is a big deal. Okay, um, they like to trick you all the time, or sometimes you know you're just not thinking about it. So when you see it, you kind of get off guard. Okay, but when you're weighing the patient, you want to make sure that it's at the same time, same clothing, and it's the same scale. Okay, because we all know, especially females, because we're kind of more weight conscious, I believe, or so. Or at least most of the time, we talk about our weight a lot, right? So we kind of tend to be on the scale, and we can t you can kind of tell when you're on the scale or you're on different scales, whether you're at the scale at Publix or um, at your home scale or the scale at the gym, they will all tell you different numbers. And it doesn't mean that each one of them is wrong, but again, the scale is not completely accurate. So there are going to be little um, things here and there that may alter it a little bit. Maybe you had on shoes, maybe you had on sneakers, and other times you don't have on any um, any, any shoes at all when you're doing it at home or you're at the gym and you have on um, you know something else you have on workout gear that's more lighter than wearing jeans or something so you want to make sure you're wearing the same clothes make sure you want it's light airy clothes and it's at the same time because sometimes you check your weight it's different from the night than, it, than in the morning I know that is for me I'm lighter in the day than I am at night um, go figure maybe because I'm eating throughout the day but I wake up in the morning and I'm back again. So um, you want to make sure that you pick that same time each time and that you use that same scale, okay? And they will have questions, what's something that you should instruct the patient when they have to check their weight or something in that nature, all right? So it's in red. Please try to remember it because it's only going to be for your benefit, all right? The next thing we have is notifying the healthcare provider. So your healthcare provider should know if you are having any fluid retention or any weight gain. And you may say, okay, what's a good um, gauge to let them know that I'm having um, weight gain that's going to be trouble troublesome? And pretty much two to three pounds for the day. If you are having a weight gain of two to three pounds for the day, that is a big indicator that something is wrong, okay? That is the treatment is not working. They may have to put more um, diuretics or something in that in that nature, but you definitely want to inform the doctor. Or five pounds for the week, okay? So any one of those numbers, if you've gained five pounds for the week or if you've gained two or three pounds for the day, you definitely want to make sure you have notified your doctor and you let him know so that way he can kind of change around your regimen and your plans um, that he has for you that, um, that is going to provide the care that you need. So we're just going to go ahead and continue on with the nursing interventions. So again, you want to notify the healthcare provider also about the signs and symptoms of the different medication that the patient may be um, um, prescribed or ordered, right? Uh, I put in red, you want to avoid over-the-counter medication. Also, you want to avoid NSAIDs. And mainly NSAIDs just because it decreases the kidney perfusion. And you probably say, why is that? Um, if you think about it, the medication works um, on the kidney, it gets metabolized in the kidney. So if the kidneys already have the risk of low perfusion because of cardiac problem and the blood is not able to um, travel or um, go to that area of the kidneys, and then the kidney now has to work on this medication, it just puts more stress and more effort on the kidney to have to work that it eventually decreases the function of the kidney. So, and um, to prevent that, you just don't want to have any patients on the NSAID. So, um, you want to avoid that and maybe give a different alternative, maybe Tylenol, if it's something for pain, um, with different things like that. So, you always, always want to check with your doctor to make sure that um, you're, you're still within the safety measures, okay? 
also you want to teach the patients about their medication, the risk factors, the lifestyle changes, because they are going to have a change of lifestyle, right? You're not going to be able to eat all the bacon in the world that you want anymore, or you may have to switch to turkey bacon. So these are some modifications that they should be aware of and that you need to teach them, right? They may be put on a cardiac diet, and of course the cardiac diet is, may, may not be the best thing because it's low sodium, low cholesterol, low pretty much everything, right? And um, again, you just want to make sure that they're aware of, and they're aware of, and they have the understanding of the diet that they need to be on and the lifestyle they, that they will have to do. And if they're not used to exercising, they may just have to go ahead and exercise, of course, at a rate of what is um, they're able to do for their heart, right? But again, they may have to start exercising or may start walking or implementing things that they have not done so um, in their life before. Um, another big thing is your advanced directives, right? Um, let's say you get in a situation where you have the congestive heart failure to the point where you um, eventually get pulmonary edema and you are on a ventilator machine or um, not able to speak for yourself just because of a lack of oxygen to, to your brain or perfusion, somewhere where you're not able to um, be within your right state of mind and have your consciousness with you. You want to make sure that you have your wishes carried out the way how you want to, that in case something was to happen, you have um, people, your healthcare proxy, who will make decisions for you on your behalf for your healthcare, um, your living will, um, things like that. So you want to make sure that you um, know all of your wishes that you want to have. If you want to have a DNR, which means do not resuscitate, or you want everything done, you want CPR. So you want to make sure that you teach the patient about all these different things so that way they can kind of plan accordingly. Not saying that these things are going to happen, but it's always good to have a plan. Now we're going to talk about more medical management, right? So these are some cardiac medications that you're going to see. And it may not just only be for congestive heart failure, but since we're on the topic of congestive heart failure, these are some medications that can be given, but they're not limited to all the other cardiac um, disorders or diseases that are out there. So when you see these medications, these are mainly mainly going to be your cardiac medications. And I'll do another video where I go more into depth about the drug to drug interaction, contraindications, side effects, adverse effects, right? Mechanism of action. So I'll do a separate video just for that. So um, for right now, I'm just gonna kind of give you, um, in a nutshell, what some of these medications can do to kind of help benefit a, per a person who has congestive heart failure. So I have my ACE inhibitors, and my ACE inhibitors ends in prills, okay? Like, example, the Cinepril, right? So anytime you see prills, they are going to be your ACE inhibitors. And what they do is they help to decrease blood pressure, and they also help to decrease the afterload, okay? And then you also have your arms, and your arms end in sartans, okay? So when you see medication that ends in sartans, that, those are your arms. And they pretty much are similar to your ACE inhibitors. They work very similar in a way, just um, a different, um, different mechanism of action, but ultimately the same results, a low blood pressure, okay? And they, these, these medications both cause hyperkalemia. So patients who are on this medication, you want to check their potassium level, okay? Also, you have your beta blockers, and your beta blockers uh, ends in LOL, okay? And or OLOL, depending on how you prefer to um, differentiate it, but they are most likely going to end in those areas. And an example is metropolol, and with that, they are going to work your beta-1 receptor. Now, just uh, for a quick understanding, you have two different types of beta cells. You have your beta-1 and you have your beta-2 uh, receptor sites, and your beta blocker for your heart is going to be your beta-1, because I have one heart, so beta-1 is going to be medications that are working towards the heart. I have uh, beta-2 receptors, I have two lungs, so um, those medications are going to work more for your uh, lungs, like your bronchodilators, right? Those are your beta blockers, but those are for your type, um, your beta blocker 2 receptors, okay? So um, receptor 1, one heart, dealing with the heart, okay? So my beta blockers, all right, is going to be dealing with the heart for my beta-1. All right. Also, I have my calcium channel blockers, and with my calcium channel blockers, I always like to remember VND. Okay, and VND stands for the main three medications that I mainly saw or see on um, on the testing or NCLEX and things like that. Um, even within um, working, 
right? Mainly when a patient is prescribed calcium channel blockers, it's either V, N, or D. And what they are, just pretty much I have parapamil, nifedipine, and diltiazem. Those are the main three uh, calcium channel blockers that are used for um, the effects of decreasing your blood pressure, okay? So they also uh, help to decrease your blood pressure as well, so I'll get out the way so you can see. And what it does is it decreases the afterload by dilating the blood vessels, okay? So it dilates the blood vessels and that's how it decreases the blood pressure, all right? And the calcium channel blockers should only be used on um, diastolic um, heart failure, okay? So remember when we went before, we were talking about the different types of heart failures that you can exhibit. So the calcium channel blockers works best on a patient who has a diastolic heart failure, all right? Also, you have your digoxin. And with digoxin, okay, this is a very special medication, not because, um, you know, it has anything extra, but this is the main drug that you're going to see um, on your testing. Right? A lot of times they like to make sure that you understand digoxin just because of how sensitive it can be towards the body. And what, that, what I mean by that is you have a such thing called digoxin toxicity, where if you have too much in the body, it can definitely mess with your potassium level, cause dysrhythmias, um, and different complications that you do not want to um, um, occur, have occur, or if you want your patient to exhibit. All right, so there is a therapeutic range, and that range is 0.5 to 2 milligrams per ml. So you want to make sure it stays in that therapeutic range, okay? Um, it does mess with the potassium level, so you want to make sure that you're checking, checking your potassium levels to make sure that um, it's at a good um, level. Because one thing we know is that when it comes to potassium, that is one electrolyte. You want to make sure that it stays balanced, okay? You don't want it to be too high. You don't want it to be too low. You want it to be just right. Most of the time, your testing question. Anytime they talk about an electrolyte, most of the time potassium is the electrolyte to monitor or to watch out for. So when you're having a medication that is um, going to alter your potassium level, you definitely want to make sure you watch out for that. And you may say, what is the big deal of potassium? Potassium is a very sensitive um, electrolyte. It is also the electrolyte that is used for um, death row when um, they're going to inject you, right? Because they have three different choices, the gas, the electric chair, or the injection. What they're injecting is potassium. So yes, potassium is a very, very big deal, okay? So you wanna make sure that you're monitoring the electrolyte. Also with the Johnson, it has an antidote, right? So like Coumadin and heparin, it does have an antidote, and that antidote is called Digivine. Right, digoxin is the only drug in that category, okay, um, of the digitalis, and pretty much digivine is the drug of choice for the antidote of toxicity. All right, so um, main thing with digoxin, what it's doing is it is increasing the contractility. Now you may say, um, how is increasing the contractility helping the heart in any type of way, right? Or you may not understand how is it helping. So I have a demonstration for you, all right? So this is my body, right? We're gonna pretend that this is my body, and um, this is my this is my heart. This is how the heart pumps to get blood to the, the remainder of the body. So the liquid that is in here is going to be my blood, right? Um, the mechanism is what I'm doing, right? My hands is going to be like my heart right and then this is going to demonstrate how the blood flows to the rest of the body all right so I'm just going to take the top off just so it makes the demonstration a lot easier okay so this is the um, the demonstration right so normally when your body is lacking cardiac output and there's no perfusion in the body right the brain signals to the heart saying hey then we don't have enough perfusion going on, we need you to pump faster, right? And you may think, oh, that makes sense. If I pump faster, I work a little bit harder, I can get blood to flow through those areas that are lacking, right? Well, not really, because I'm not doing it effectively. So this is what's going on when there's a low perfusion, right? Because all this area here needs blood. It's missing blood. So the blood is here. So when I pump, and I'm pumping fast, and let me pump it really fast, right? But it's not being effective. So, how much blood is actually getting to the rest of the body? 
not much. And the heart is just working hard, working really, really hard, but still nothing, right? And it's getting a little bit exerted because it's working harder. It requires more. It requires more oxygen demand that the body is not able to meet because I have a low cardiac output. So the rest of the body can't get what it needs, nor can my heart get what it needs. So that's not really helping anyone. Okay, so with the, the, with the Doxin or any medication that is going to increase the contractility, what it does is it says, hey, we're not going to be pumping fast, we're going to pump effectively. Okay, so we're not going to work hard, we're going to work smart. So what the Doxin does, it pretty much squeezes. Okay, so you see how much fluid I was able to get to the rest of my body, right? So I'm here and I'm just going to squeeze and squeeze, and squeeze, right? This is way more effective than trying to go like this. Right? So this is tachycardia, but it's not being that effective. And this is contractility, increasing contractility. Okay? Which is way more effective, okay? So in the process of me contracting, right? In order for me to give a good, forceful, powerful contraction, more effective contraction, right? I have to slower my heart rate. So my heart rate has to decrease in order for me to do that. So one thing with this medication is it is going to decrease the heart rate. And as it decreases the heart rate, you want to make sure that you're not getting into a zone where you have bradycardia. So another thing you want to watch out for with the Doxin is um, heart rate less than 60. If it is less than 60, you want to make sure that you're holding that medication, right? You want to, um, so call the doctor, let him know, and you also want to hold that medication. And the way how you check the heart rate, you don't use any assistive devices or um, any mechanical um, machinery. You want to do it um, manually, okay? So I know at ICU, you know, we have everything on the monitors and everything um, already set. You can see all of the vitals right in there on the screen, but you also want to just check manually by the apical pulse. So you want to have your stethoscope and put your diagram, your diaphragm here, and as you're listening, um, for one full minute, you want to make sure that you're um, checking your heart rate, um, that it's not less than 60, okay? Because if it is, you want to hold this medication. Also, another thing with the Joxin, you're given the IV, you want to make sure that you're pushing it slow. Also, you have Milonum, which is a vasodilator, and what it does is it decreases the preload and afterload, and also decreases the cardiac workload, which is a good thing because you don't want the heart to work hard, you want the heart to work smart, okay? Also, you have dibutamine, and with dibutamine, um, these, this medication is going to be used mainly for um, patients who have significant um, left ventricular dysfunction or hyperperfusion. Okay, and what this medication is also doing is it, it is increasing the contractility. So when you think of this as a demonstration that I just showed you, you want to kind of think of that for dibutamine or any other medication that is going to cause increased contractility. Okay which those medications are called, are, are called positive inotropes, okay? And when you have a positive inotrope, that is exactly what's going to happen. It's increasing the contractility, all right? And then you have your anticoagulants, and your anticoagulants are pretty much for um, your patients who may have underlying rhythm of AFib, or AFib, which is AFib fibrillation, which those people are more prone to have a blood clot, or if you have a DVT, or, um, or any any type of event, a, a throm thrombolic event, or a risk of thrombolic event, you're going to be placed on your anticoagulant medications, okay? And then you have, last but not least, your hyperlipidemia medications, which are pretty much your cholesterol medication to help lower your cholesterol, and those medications are going to end in your statins, okay? So like, an example is your simvastatin, right? Any medication that ends in statin, those are your cholesterol medication. So again, I hope that um, knowing um, the different endings of these medications can kind of help you um, differentiate what category they belong to because you may not always have that um, stated in the question. You may say, what medication is this? You know, if I only knew the category, I'll be able to answer this question, right? So um, just try to pick up on those little tips and tricks and hints every now and then. Um, when you're reading or you're studying, if you notice that a category just has the same ending, you know, kind of drop that down, it'll definitely make studying a whole lot easier. Right. And last but not least, we have our surgical interventions. And of course, you're going to do the surgical interventions if medication and everything has, has failed, right? And you're going to try to use this as a last resort. So with that said, if the reason for the 
heart failure is because of CAD, which is coronary artery disease, right? You may want to do a coronary artery uh, revascularization with percutaneous coronary intervention, okay? Also, um, if that doesn't help, or depending on um, um, the route that the, the surgeon decides to use, they may do a coronary artery bypass surgery, okay? So when you hear someone has like a triple bypass or quadruple bypass, pretty much what that means is um, it's three different areas where they had to do the bypassing, where they had to either do um, the stenting or what they'll do, they'll take um, um, part of your vessel from your long, your longest vein, which is your saphenous vein, and they'll pretty much take some of that away from your popliteal um, area as well, um, and pretty much take some of that um, vessel, cut cut into a, a, a little section or so that they can use, and they'll pretty much stretch the other section, attach it and so so that way you can still have blood flow there, and they're going to take that vessel or so, and they may go ahead and put it in the area where that coronary artery, coronary artery is blocked or has some type of blockage, okay? So they'll do that three times or four times or two times depending on how many bypasses they have. So when you hear about a triple bypass or double bypass, that's pretty much what they're meaning, um, what they're trying to say, is that that had to happen two times, three times, four times. So of course, the more you have, the worse it is because that lets you know that um, all those areas were blocked. Okay, so um, if you know someone who had that done and they're still alive, that is great because the outcome of that happening is not very often, especially if they have to do a quadruple bypass, you know, because four different places of the heart was, uh, was blocked. And uh, most of those people don't get to live very long because of the damage that the heart had to endure um, before the surgery was even um, able to, to be um to be done, okay? So you also have your implantable cardioverter defibrillator, which is your ICD, and with that, you're going to use that for severe ventricular dysfunction that can be life-threatening, all right? You also have your CRT, which is your cardiac resynchronization therapy, and with that is the use of biventricular pacemaker to treat um, electrical conduction defects, okay? Um, we also have your ultrafiltration, which you're going to use for a severe patient who has like severe fluid overload. And with this, um, is a machine, it's almost like a dialysis machine or so, but not exactly. But it's going to filter out the blood, um, give back the patient their blood products while it's discarding the extra fluid, um, okay? And with it, it's pretty much everything is measured um, and it's, it's very precise. So if the fluid is not removed at a certain time and things like that, because you're, you're doing it hourly, right? And, it's, and this is happening over hours. So every hour or so you want to go in and dump the fluid, mark down, um, write um, how much was, 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 um, was left and different um, rates of, of um, what the, the machine has the settings at. And anytime those fluids are not balanced, the machine is going to ring uh, until you fix it or um, find out what the concern is, okay? And, um, again, these are mainly going to be used for your cardiac patients who are severely um, overloaded with fluid, alright? Then you have your cardiac transplantation, okay? So your cardiac transplant. So this is going to be used for your severe patients, right, who are in their end stage um, heart failure. And this is like their last choice, right? So they're going to be put on the list until they are able to find someone, a donor who can be a match for them. All right, so again, these are all the different surgeries that could take place for a patient who has heart failure. And one of the main things that you want to do is um, monitor for complications. Okay, with any surgery, there's always risk for complications. Uh, even without the surgery, right, for the medications, you want to monitor for any complication. If you see that the heart is not improving or it's getting worse or something is going on where it's not giving that therapeutic effect. Right, you want to make sure that you are able to call the doctor. Of course, you know, you want to make sure that you're checking the vital signs and make sure the patient is stable and you know, seeing exactly what is going on with them. All right, so again, this is congestive heart failure. So, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, please share. Um, if you have not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? Go ahead and click that subscribe button. If you have any questions or any comments, um, you can go ahead and leave that in the comment sections below. 
please remember to check out my description box where I will have even more information that I don't always um, state on the video. So if you're anal just like me and just want just that extra information, please be, feel free to check out my description box, all right? So again, thank you for coming on this journey and see you on the next one. Thanks for watching.